Michael Ibrahim is joining us from Sydney, Australia, where it is actually tomorrow, strangely enough, and he is with the St. Cyril's Coptic Orthodox Theological College. He serves as the Director of Learning and Teaching. He's also finishing up a Ph.D. on Severus of Antioch, making him particularly suitable for our project today. So, welcome, Michael, all the way from Sydney. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, John. It's a, it's a real honor and a privilege to be with you. Uh, uh, you know, uh, ancient faith means so much to me, so oh. it's, uh, yeah. I well, you, know, you never know who's listening and where they are. So uh, yeah. knowing that uh, you are part of our family all the way over, under, wherever in Sydney uh, really is gratifying to hear. Thank you. Well, we want to learn from you today because we've been going through this journey of trying to learn more about our brothers and sisters in the Oriental Orthodox, some say the non-Chalcedonian, uh, and you are part of the Coptic Church, so uh, this is uh, very appropriate because we're going to be talking about Severus of Antioch, and of course uh, to you, that's Saint Severus of Antioch. So we want to find out why he's a saint for you and not for us, and learn a little bit about who he was, uh, what his role was in the church, but also what his role was in this controversy from uh, the Chalcedon Council of 451. So let's start with Severus himself. Give us an overview of who he was and his connection to the Council of Chalcedon. And just kind of a primer for us who need to know. Yeah. Um, so Severus, uh, in fact, is a, is a fascinating uh, historical figure, uh, you know, for, from a purely intellectual perspective. Uh, he was uh, born in uh, Sisopolis uh, in the in the Pisidia, so in in, in Asia Minor, uh, you know, kind of within the orbit of, of uh, Antioch in, in, in Asia Minor. Um, he was born to a, a, a fairly well-off family. His father is described as being a, a senator. Uh, whether or not that meant he was part of the Senate in Constantinople or whether or not he was just a local councillor, I'm not entirely sure. But we know that he came from a very well-off family, and it's in fact a family which, uh, according to his biographers, had a connection with the uh, previous um, Bishop of Sisopolis, whose name was also Severus, uh, because uh, the elder Severus was his uh, paternal uh, grandfather. And uh, his, his, uh, his paternal grandfather actually was a uh, supporter of St. Cyril, and we, we find his uh, signature occurring three times in the Acts uh, in the various documents from the Council of Ephesus in uh, 431. So there's, a, there's a, a connection there between kind of the Alexandrian um, legacy and Severus of Antioch's uh, immediate family. Now, he didn't actually grow up particularly religious. Um, he seemed to have been quite a, an intelligent uh, young man. Um, after his uh, father passed away, his uh, mother uh, sent him and his uh, two older brothers to Alexandria to study um, uh, rhetoric. And whilst there, he met uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Zacharias, who went on to become the Bishop of uh, Mytilene. Uh, so Zacharias was, in fact, the one who introduced him uh, to the church fathers. And it's interesting that uh, what we find with, uh, with uh, Severus is that what attracted him to the church fathers, in fact, was their rhetorical prowess. So, in fact, uh, it was Saint uh, Basil uh, who was the, the first person who really grabbed uh, uh, Severus of Antioch's uh, attention. And so over time, he then uh, uh, became uh, uh, convinced of Christianity. He then was baptised after a miraculous event at the Shrine of Leontius and became a monk uh, within Gaza. Uh, he was led a very ascetic life, in fact, to the point where his health was in a lot of danger. Uh, so he, he returned from living in the wilderness. He returned uh, to the monastery of uh, Romanos. Uh, and then from there, actually, then started to become involved in the Christological uh, arguments. But initially, he seemed to have not been partisan in either direction. He seems to have been initially a nominal Christian and then eventually... Uh, drawn into the um, uh, into the fray, um, so he really came under the influence of particular uh, uh, Peter the Iberian, who uh, mm -hmm. was a very significant figure in, in, in uh, monasticism in Gaza. Um, yeah, and then from there he um, 
uh, he travelled to Constantinople for three years where he won over the uh, the Emperor Anastasios and mm. uh, eventually managed to, with the help of uh, Philoxenus of Mabug, uh, became the, uh, the, the Patriarch of Antioch. And he was only Patriarch for, for a period of six years up until uh, 518. So he was Patriarch from 512 to 518. Um, and whilst there he... Um, uh, was really re responsible for a lot of uh, reforms uh, within the Patriarchate, particularly to do with the um, uh, philanthropic work of, of the Patriarchate. Uh, when Justin became emperor, uh, he was forced to flee to Egypt. And we have an account, actually, of his, uh, of his flight that he wrote, uh, which was uh, recently discovered and translated, which is uh, quite a fascinating document, actually. Hmm. Um, and then he, yeah, so he ended up in Egypt then uh, from there pretty much for the rest of his life, except for an 18 month period uh, between 535 and 536, where he was invited by the Emperor Justinian and, and uh, the Empress Theodora to try to negotiate a, uh, a settlement to the controversy. Okay. And he seems to, in fact, have gotten very close to finding a solution. Uh, hmm. It was only really with the arrival of. Uh, uh, pope uh, Agapetus from uh, from Rome, uh, that uh, that the Pope then insisted that uh, non Chalcedonians be excluded outright. Okay. Uh, you know, in order to kind of safeguard the legacy of of, uh, uh, of Leo, uh, and so that was that was really the point at which really we have the, the creation of two separate um, jurisdictions. So it sounds like maybe he was a generation after St. Cyril. Uh, Cyril died, I believe, in 444. I know it was before the Council of Chalcedon in 451. So uh, what was his relationship to St. Cyril of Alexandria? Yeah, so, so uh, Severus was born in, in um, uh, sometime between 456 and 465. So he was uh, definitely a... Uh, one generation removed at least. Okay. Um, the thing that's interesting with uh, Severus and uh, St. Cyril is that, in a sense, uh, St. Severus was kind of a reluctant Cyrillian. And what I mean by that is uh, his interest in, in, in St. Cyril was really one of uh, what he considered to be defending the legacy of, of St. Cyril as opposed to a an immediate engagement with his um, uh, Christology. H having said that, St. Cyril is the most quoted church father in, uh, in Severus's uh, corpus, uh, but that's often in a, in a polemical setting. The thing that's fascinating is that if you take away some of the polemical uh, works, what we find is that the most quoted father in, in St. Severus of Antioch is actually St. Basil. So that fascination with Basil mm. really seemed to continue uh, for... for um, uh, for Saint uh, Severus, but but one of the things that he did for, for Saint Cyril and Saint Cyril's legacy actually was to uh, solidify and clarify some of the terminological ambiguity that we find with Saint Cyril. So one of the things that's very interesting, and I think that we often uh, look back uh, with the rose-coloured glasses at, at at the achievement of the Church Fathers, uh, but uh, you know if you look at somebody like Saint Cyril. Uh, he didn't have the kind of training in uh, philosophy that, say, the Cappadocians had. Mm. And so when he's uh, trying to express the mystery of Christ, uh, he's searching for terminology. And so for him, kind of this idea of nature then becomes a, a central uh, theme. And then throughout his works, in fact, there seems to be a real fluidity with the way that he applies the term nature. And certainly both Chalcedonians and non-Chalcedonians could kind of uh, fairly uh, uh, comfortably divide his works down the middle and ignore one half and say, oh, look, he exclusively uses nature in this sense. <laughs> and uh, the other side to say, well, no, he exclusively uses nature in this sense. But, but what uh, what's, uh, Severus was able to do, in fact, was to harmonise uh, St. Cyril's use of the term nature. So it's interesting in, in, the, in the sense that what he does is he understands the term nature, in fact, as being a, a fairly flexible term, one that could be a, a approached from, from the perspective of, uh, of subject, uh, its subject being a person, in which case you see one nature. But he also understands the fact that uh, nature, if understood as a concept, is more akin to uh, essence, in which case we can talk about the natures of Christ as well. So, But his preference is for the one nature because 
his entry point is always kind of this relational um, scriptural vision of Christ. You know, when, in the scriptures, when you meet Christ, you don't meet natures, you meet, you meet a person. And so that's why he has this emphasis on on kind of the Cyrillian form, uh, that famous Cyrillian formula of, of uh, one nature of God, the Word incarnate. Now, uh, let me defend the Chalcedonian approach. Uh, in fact, um, the, the application of the term nature is uh, better harmonised, in fact, with the way that uh, Aristotle originally used the term. So, so there is a legitimacy there to the Chalcedonian use of the term nature. Uh, having said that, the church fathers uh, we've seen time and time again are not bound by uh, ancient categories and they often re uh, form and reuse terminology, uh, as we saw, with, you know, with the Cappadocians in, in uh, Trinitarian theology, or with Saint Athanasius when he, you know, changed his mind about one hypostasis versus three hypostases in, in uh, when it came to the Trinity, where he used hypostasis originally as a term for essence, and then he then shifted it over to a more uh, person-focused uh, 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 term. So what? Yes. So in other words, what we find is that the church fathers themselves were in fact not necessarily bound by, by that terminology, and so, yeah. so so the Chalcedonian side is is more faithful to the uh, Aristotelian, okay. uh, whereas kind of the Alexandrian side is probably uh, considering things um, from a little bit more of a, so, a soteriological perspective as opposed to kind of a conceptual uh, perspective. Got it. So, uh, thinking about uh, Eutyches, who both the non-Chalcedonian and Chalcedonian Orthodox uh, regard as a heretic, was Severus contemporary with Eutyches, and uh, if so, what was his relationship to him? Uh, no, he wasn't uh, contemporary with uh, with uh, Eutyches. He, he um, Eutyches. Uh, uh, passed away, I think, before Severus was uh, was born. Um, uh, Eutyches has been uh, consistently uh, denounced as heretical uh, within uh, the non-Chalcedonian tradition, and certainly he's consistently considered uh, uh, kind of a, a, an arch-heretic uh, as far as uh, Severus is concerned. So, um, in fact, one of the things that Severus is quite uh, passionately involved in is fighting Eutychianism. Uh, so, you know, his, his most uh, significant uh, work in terms of uh, length is his polemic with uh, Julian, the Bishop of Halicarnassus, uh, who had a more Eutychian understanding of Christ's humanity. And uh, Severus uh, is, is passionately uh, engaged in, in polemics against uh, this particular trend within non-Chalcedonianism. Very helpful. So what was it, Michael, that makes uh, those of us who are part of the Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, Chalcedonian, uh, view him differently as not a saint, whereas uh, the Coptic Church and our other friends in the non-Chalcedonian world view him as a saint. What's the key difference there? Mm. Well, I, actually, on, on that point, it, it's very interesting, and I think that this uh, might provide a little bit of helpful input in terms of the way that we talk about um, potential reunification of, of, of uh, the Christian East. Uh, in the Armenian tradition, uh, Severus is not considered a saint. And in fact, uh, for a, a quite a period of time, he was considered a heretic within the Armenian tradition. Uh, but nonetheless, that didn't mean that there was a break of communion between, uh, between uh, the Armenians and the rest of the Oriental Orthodox uh, uh, world. Um, so certainly from an Oriental Orthodox perspective, kind of uh, having a neatly lined up list of saints is, isn't a prerequisite for communion. Um, uh, in terms of what, what makes him a saint from uh, the uh, non-Chalcedonian uh, perspective, uh, he really was responsible for kind of solidifying the Christological language uh, and really giving it a systematic uh, basis. Uh, one of the things that's not often remembered about uh, Severus as well is he was, in fact, a, a very complex, multidimensional figure. So besides his polemical works, he was a, a remarkable hymnographer. So we have nearly 300 of his hymns that he penned. He was a remarkable uh, orator, and, in fact, he was compared even during his lifetime to, to St. John Chrysostom, uh, whom he admired greatly. Um, 
Uh, he was a, a great ascetic as well, uh, and he was a great uh, kind of moral theologian in the sense that he, if we analyse the, the 125 sermons of his that we have, uh, his homilies, uh, there's a, a real great emphasis on on Christian life and Christian conduct, and in fact connecting that to church dogma. Uh, so all of these things together, put together, really making a, a very significant figure. Um, the other thing as well is we also need to understand his legacy generally within within the Christian East. I mean, I think uh, uh, even uh, Father John Meyendorf and, and uh, recently uh, Father John Bear and uh, Father John McGuckin have all, um, you know, described Severus as a very important intellectual figure uh, within within the Christian uh, East. And uh, if I ask uh, my uh, uh, Chalcedonian uh, sisters and brothers to reflect on it, it's, it's interesting uh, to... Uh, consider, like, if I was to ask, you know, who are the significant saints from the 6th century within the uh, uh, Byzantine tradition, um, there are certainly lots of uh, great saints, uh, but there's no one of kind of the calibre of, of, of um, uh, for example, a Cyril. It's not really until we get to St Maximus that we have somebody of that calibre. And, by the way, this isn't just my opinion. This is uh, according to, to Father John Meindorf. Um, uh yeah, and, and so he really dominated the landscape uh, for both Chalcedonians and non-Chalcedonians. Obviously, for the non-Chalcedonians from a, in a very positive way and then for Chalcedonians in a very negative way because he was uh, uh, he didn't move on the issue of Chalcedon, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> and so, I mean, uh, you, you think back about... Uh differences in language and differences in culture and some of the political intrigue that was happening between Rome and maybe some of the rest of the of the church. As you look back on it now as an expert in Severus of Antioch, do you think this is all just a misunderstanding involving terminology and language, or were there substantive theological differences that one or the other championed or uh, denied? The that's a, a tricky question to answer because yes, there were terminological differences in the sense that the understanding of, of, of the term nature was different between Chalcedonians and non-Chalcedonians. Uh, obviously, non-Chalcedonians tended to favour kind of the, for want of a better term, kind of an earlier Cyrillian understanding of nature, whereas um, Chalcedonians leaned more on his more um, uh, diplomatic uh, use of nature after the Council of, of uh, Ephesus in 431. But I think it is incorrect, and this is unfortunately, I think, something which is problematic, to say that it was a linguistic or a cultural problem because, uh, you know, Severus was a uh, native Greek speaker uh, from, uh, from Asia Minor who was, uh, spoke both Greek and Latin uh, and, uh, you know, he didn't speak Syriac, although he seemed to have, have a, a working knowledge of Semitic languages. Um, he, uh, you know, so a lot of the, the, the main figures all the way through the 6th century in non-Chalcedonianism were uh, very much embedded within the Byzantine world and were Greek speakers and Greek thinkers. So I think to, uh, to say that it's a linguistic issue is probably a little bit anachronistic, um, uh, you know, perhaps when we get down, you know, maybe three or four centuries later, that might be the case, but certainly not at this, uh, not at this stage. Um, yes, and he was out off the scene by the time the Fifth Council came, where, as some have told me, uh, some clarification or some further explanation of uh, Chalcedon took place. Is that your understanding? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And look, certainly from a non-Chalcedonian reading of that history, I think that um, uh, that the clarification which took place in the Fifth Ecumenical Council was in fact very significant, uh, and significant for a few reasons. Firstly, it allowed the uh, Chalcedonians, the Eastern Orthodox Church today, to re-engage with the memory of Chalcedon in a Cyrillian kind of way, uh, because... Uh, you know, one of the arguments made against Chalcedon uh, when, uh, when Chalcedon took place was that, in fact, sidelined uh, to a large extent St. Cyril. Now, now um, uh, I would argue that uh, today, at least, that the memory of Chalcedon uh, in the Eastern Orthodox Church is a very Cyrillian one. Um, 
But the question then becomes of, well, why did that happen? And really, from a non-Calcedonian perspective, that really happens uh, as a result of a, a fairly um, consistent non-Calcedonian opposition uh, to the Council of Chalcedon, which really forced uh, uh, the supporters of the Council to, to, to really reimagine the way that the, that the, that the Council um, uh, reimagined the intent of... of of the council and many of the dogmatic uh, de uh, declarations that happened at, at in um, the fifth ecumenical council were in fact points that non-Chalcedonians had been arguing for a very long time. So, for example, theopascite theology was a very significant um, theological string that starts with uh, with Saint Cyril, really, and 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 uh, is followed all the way through the the. Um, non-Chalcedonian thought, uh, yeah, and it's that's, really only that's the that's the doctrine about that God suffered in the flesh. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yep, yep. Um, even though, in interestingly, uh, Severus uh, would have rejected the term theopascite, and he does explicitly uh, because he doesn't mean that suffering happens in the divine, but rather that the suffering truly becomes the divine's because the the humanity is truly the words in his incarnational state. Um, so, you know, th these things were embraced by uh, Chalcedonians, but th they were embraced because uh, non-Chalcedonians, in fact, made a, a pretty good argument uh, for why that was uh, theologically significant. And we can trace that all the way back to St. Cyril of Alexandria's 12th Anathema, uh, which, uh, which is a Theopascite uh, anathema. Uh, and which, interestingly, is is the, the anathema that, that Chalcedonians initially uh, wrestled with for the first uh, few decades after the Council of Chalcedon. Uh, it, the idea of saying that the word suffered in the flesh was a, was a, was a sensitive issue for, for the Chalcedonian position. Well, you had mentioned earlier some of the contributions that Severus made to the Eastern Orthodox, including hymnology. Uh, what are maybe one or two examples of hymns that we might recognize that he had a hand in uh, penning. Yeah, uh, well, look, the most significant one, and, and uh, this isn't a 100% definitive, but I think that there is significant uh, evidence to suggest that this is the case, uh, is in fact the uh, liturgical hymn, uh, Monogenes Eos, uh, Our Only Begotten uh, Word, uh, sorry, Our Only Begotten Son, which is uh, used by all uh, of the uh, churches in the East, uh, Orientals and uh, Eastern uh, Orthodox. So used, for example, in the Armenian uh, and Syriac uh, traditions at every uh, divine liturgy, at every Eucharistic liturgy, and within the Coptic Rite, uh, it's used uh, on four different occasions uh, within, within the uh, liturgical life of the church, most notably actually uh, on... Uh, uh, at the sixth hour uh, prayers for Good Friday, uh, where we uh, where we commemorate the crucifixion uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ, um, yeah. So he's probably responsible for penning that, and and there's lots of I, I won't bore you with 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 all of the uh, the arguments for it, but um, uh, certainly if we compare uh, the the uh, the style of, of the hymns to to um, the 300 or so hymns that we have of his uh, to, to Omonogenes, we find that same kind of chiastic structure. We find the same kind of evocative uh, invocation at the end, you know, Sozonimas, save us. Um, uh, you know, most of his hymns will end with something like that. Praise be to thee, uh, have mercy on us, O Lord. Um, uh, and uh, all of the theological themes, in fact, that we find in, in um uh, Monogenesi or uh, things that we find in uh, the writings of Severus. Hmm. Now, the, the other, the, the Byzantine tradition is that this is ascribed to uh, 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 the Emperor Justinian. Yes, um, I've heard this. Now, yeah, and that actually relies on a, uh, the first reference we have uh, to Justinian being linked with that is from the 9th century. Uh, so uh, Theophanes the Confessor, in his uh, Thronographia, the, the, his uh, uh, History uh, talks about uh, Justinian in the year uh, 536. Now, it's interesting, the word itself, it doesn't say he uh, wrote the hymn or anything like that, but rather that he ordered the singing of the hymn uh, within the church. Uh, now, keep in mind that 536 is the point at which uh, both Chalcedonians and non-Chalcedonians had almost reached an agreement on Christology. 
which was cut short then then by, by the um the visit of, of, of the roman uh, pope uh so this hymn is a really beautiful unifying uh christological confession that both chalcedonians and non-chalcedonians can look at and say yes that is orthodox christology uh in a sense what you find is is that the uh is is, is really the the culmination of all of these attempts to find a formulation that both Chalcedonians and non-Chalcedonians can accept. Uh, so, for you know, examples of that, are obviously Zeno's Henoticon, uh, or Peter the Fuller's uh, modification to the Trisagion. Uh, but 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 uh, Amorgenis uh, succeeded. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that was also uh, following that uh, the Emperor uh, Justinian then uh, issued. Uh, uh, a series of laws then making uh, non-Chalcedonianism illegal uh, within the, the, the Byzantine Empire and confiscating property. And, and really, this is the point at which we have a, a, an actual split. Uh, before this point, both uh, non-Chalcedonians never, ever viewed themselves as anything other than outside of the imperial church. Uh, the way that they viewed the whole conflict was that it was an argument within the body of the church as to what was the most appropriate Christological um, confession. Uh, we, we find, uh, you know, Severus is uh, very, very um, uh, patriotic towards the Byzantine uh, Empire and towards the emperors uh, and uh, really never viewed himself as outside of that structure but rather within it and uh, seeking to uh, guide it along uh, what he considered to be the orthodox path. From an Oriental Orthodox perspective, I don't think there is a uh, any kind of demand to accept uh, Severus. Um, the only thing that's very important is to allow each of the traditions to maintain their identity and their the path that led them to what we both recognise as being Orthodoxy. Uh, so what I mean by that is there's nothing in particular about the Eastern Orthodox Church that the Oriental Orthodox would want to see changed. Even, you know, the, the, the councils or anything like that. I think that there is a general acceptance that this is part of the formation of Eastern Orthodox orthodoxy. Um, and I think that we would just like that kind of um, uh, uh, approach taken with us as well. Uh, whereas I think that Eastern Orthodox tend to be a little bit more rigid in terms of, of what defines Eastern Orthodoxy. So, you know, who's a saint or um, how many councils are there become, uh, you know, doctrinal points um, uh, as opposed to kind of historical uh, milestones, which is the way that they tend to be viewed a little bit more within the uh, Oriental Orthodox Church. Okay, so in terms of the... Um Coptic Church's relationship to the saints of the Eastern Orthodox Church post uh, separation of Chalcedon. Uh, I would imagine Pope Leo is not real, they're not real fond of him. And uh, yeah. uh, who, who else uh, notably uh, would be on that list of, I don't know whether anathematized is the word or just not recognized? Yeah, look, uh, the vast majority of, of the saints uh, after the split were, are not recognised. Um, uh, but in terms of an explicit anathema, as far as I'm aware, it's only uh, Pope Leo who is, uh, who is uh, anathematised. Um, and uh, I still think that there is a valid point to say that, that you know, um, uh, the memory of Leo, even within the Eastern Orthodox Church, doesn't quite have the same status as uh, a lot of the other saints as well. Um, uh, from from a, certainly from an Oriental Orthodox perspective, his his, his um, uh, approach to for the formulation of Christology uh, sounds a lot more like Tertullian than than than, um, than any of the uh, Eastern uh, Fathers. And so, you know, there is a point to be made that. Um, you know, his, his approach to Christology is a little bit uh, questionable. And, in fact, that from an Eastern Orthodox perspective, when uh, you guys remember the Council of Chalcedon, you remember it uh, through a real Cyrillian uh, uh, lens. Uh, the tome doesn't play a very big part. You know, when, when I studied it at the Greek Orthodox Theological College here in, in Sydney, 
uh, you know, we didn't study the the the, uh, uh, the Tome of Leo as a document uh, that uh, was, uh, you know, significant for, for Eastern Orthodox identity. But we did study Cyril, for example, and Cyril's an mm-hmm. Um uh, Yeah, so... so, so I think even even within the East, I'm, I'm probably ruffling a, a few feathers there, uh, but um, the memory of Leo is not as central to the East as as, as uh, it would first appear. Yeah, you know, and I'm certainly not a theologian and not qualified to even give a perspective other than I have picked up on that uh, in my interviews, even with uh, Chalcedonian Eastern Orthodox uh, theologians, and more about the tome than maybe about him uh, and the fact that uh, there was some effort to make that tome the new creed and that uh, that was uh, actually uh, rejected and the council ended up being more based on St. Cyril than anything else. So. Mm. Well, it's very interesting. In, in fact, um, what we know is that uh, at, at the Council of Chalcedon, in fact, uh, when they were asked to draft a confession of faith, that they drafted a confession of faith the initial draft, in fact, used uh, the term uh, from two natures to describe our Lord Jesus Christ, which uh, the Oscaros, the, 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 the uh, patriarch of Alexandria who would, who would be excommunicated at, at the council, in fact, uh, agreed to. And it was the terminology that was used uh, in the formula of reunion of 433 between uh, the Antiochians and the Alexandrians. So I'm, I'm probably being a, a little bit... Uh, uh, biased when I say this, but I kind of get the feeling that the Eastern instinct of uh, of the council was, uh, if it wasn't for Roman intervention, that maybe from two natures would have been the uh, the uh, final uh, formulation uh, as opposed to in two natures, which was uh, insisted upon. Um, the other thing as well is, is uh, certainly from a uh, non-Chalcedonian perspective, we really do view... Uh, the legacy of Leo as being the first uh, uh, marker in this idea of, of, of uh, unhealthy papal primacy, um, uh, you know, with, with, with things like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Leo writing a, a, a private document to uh, Flavian and then expecting the, the whole church to, to accept that as a confession of faith without uh, any kind of discussion. So, uh, Michael, you've been very generous with your time, and uh, I'm really interested, and with everybody I talk to, I kind of am asking the same question here as we conclude. Can you envision a path toward unity where both families of Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, could be happy and satisfied with the outcome? Tell us what that would look like. That is, in fact, a very tricky question. Uh, I can, uh, as to how uh, reasonable and realistic that is, that's a completely different uh, question. <laughs> um, uh, I think one of the things, the, the path forward is to really, firstly, to uh, try to understand each other in terms of what we're trying to say, not how we're saying it. And I think that as long as we get caught up on the how, then when it's going to be very difficult to uh, move forward. Um, I think the other thing as well, is, you know, from a pragmatic perspective, um, Oriental Orthodoxy is uh, considerably more diverse than, than, than Eastern Orthodoxy. You know, the Syriac rite is very different to the Coptic rite, very different to the Armenian, uh, very different to the uh, Ethiopian and the Eritrean. Um, uh, so... As long as also there is room for the continued uh, uniqueness of each of these traditions with their particular commemoration of saints, with their particular understanding of history, uh, then I think that that would be possible. I think where things get tricky uh, is uh, there, there's kind of a, certainly from an Oriental Orthodox perspective, there, there is more of a uniformity within Eastern Orthodoxy, which is both a positive thing um, uh, but also means, you know, it's difficult for us to fit into that, um, uh, into that uh, uh, system. The other thing that's also very problematic, uh, and this is probably getting a little bit uh, political, and, and I apologise for that. <laughs> um, also, I think that, that within uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, generally there is a, um, a feeling of, of Oriental Orthodoxy of being kind of a, an, an interesting little corner of the East, but not really particularly... Um, uh, significant. Uh, 
Hmm. So, um, you know, so for a lot of Eastern Orthodox, when they think of Christianity, they think they think of two halves: uh, the Western half, uh, which has fallen into heresy, and then the Eastern half, which is just them. Hmm. And then, if they look really close to that, say, okay, there's a couple of other little groups uh, out there. So, I think that also, to, you know, to, to recognise that that we as Oriental Orthodox, in fact, uh, maintain an important part of Eastern identities as well. That it's not something that lives exclusively within uh, Eastern Orthodoxy. And then but because of then that focus um, really more towards the West uh, for Eastern Orthodoxy, there's a tendency to overlook uh, the Oriental Orthodox churches. And then when they are engaged with, it does happen, it gets caught up with kind of uh, uh, intra-Eastern Orthodox politics as well. Uh, you know, so if, if one patriarchate is talking to us, then the other patriarchate will accuse them of, of being heretical, uh, mm. you know, talking to heretics and, and, you know, and then, you know, vice versa. Uh, mm. So uh, we can sometimes be a little bit of a, a football that gets passed around. <laughs> yeah, I, I get that. It's interesting, Michael. Um, in preparation for this documentary, my wife and I took a Saturday morning, I think it was this past Saturday morning, actually, and we searched on uh, YouTube uh, uh, for the Divine Liturgy recording of each of the five major Oriental Orthodox churches. And we came away, now certainly the language and the style of the music, I mean, hey, you know, when I became Orthodox, we came into the Antiochian tradition, and uh, uh, there were some strange sounds in my ear that I'd not heard before, because just culturally wasn't something I was used to. Uh, and so apart from, yeah, okay, it's a little it's hard to, you know, get into the, the, the music, but we knew what was going on. I mean, the ethos of the, the worship, and you compare that to any other Christian experience, whether it's Catholic, Roman Catholic, or Protestant, and the thousands of Protestant variations on that, or pre-Vatican, post-Vatican in the Catholic Church, you don't get that. And to me, uh, there is a certain miraculous component of experiencing this sameness throughout the Orthodox world, uh, whether it is Eastern Orthodox or Oriental Orthodox. And that is just me from a layman's standpoint. Uh, again, I'm not qualified to make any pronounce pronouncements theologically, but I will say I felt at home. Uh, in in all of them, uh, because I think that's real. I th I think it is got to be the Holy Spirit that has kept that continuity despite our divisions. I mean, think about yeah. it. We don't really talk to each other, but yeah. yet here both families are doing the same thing as they've done for centuries, and uh, and we can look at each other and we can say, yeah, I recognize that. That's, that's yeah. Uh, absolutely uh, spot on and that's certainly been my experience as well um when when we think about it uh in some kind of fortuitous way uh the schism has had uh, a few positives and one of which is the fact that uh after one and a half millennia that we come back together and we look at what we're doing and the fact that there is so much resonance hmm. really is a testimony to the orthodoxy of both sides and the yeah. fidelity of both sides which is something which would have been lost had there you know, been a continuation of, of, um, of communion. And, and look, look, what you say about, about liturgies uh, uh, absolutely uh, spot on. Um, you know, from a Coptic Orthodox perspective, uh, uh, our liturgy initially was uh, celebrated in Greek, and it was uh, really only became a Coptic um, uh, much later. It was Coptic in Upper Egypt uh, for a little bit longer, probably going back to about the 3rd century, but... Um, Certainly, in terms of the, the formal liturgy, it continued to be Greek. And today, even uh, the vast majority of the uh, uh, the deacons' responses or the chanters' responses are still Greek. Hmm. Um, and so, when I go to a Greek Orthodox liturgy, for example, uh, I, I can almost participate. Um, I had the, the remarkable blessing of spending uh, three days on Mount Athos uh, early hmm. uh, last year, and. Uh, you know, the, the, the spiritual resonances. I was yeah. traveling with, uh, with, 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 with a Coptic monk, in fact, and his, his comments were, this is just like being back in my own monastery. <laughs> Isn't that something? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, really so, uh, remarkable to me. Yeah, glory be to God, really. That's, uh, Seriously, absolutely. Well, we've been talking with Michael Ibrahim, joining us from Sydney, Australia. And he is with the St. Cyril's Coptic Orthodox Theological College. He serves as the Director of Learning and Teaching. But more relevant to our purposes, he is uh, finishing up a Ph.D. on Severus of Antioch. And so it's been particularly useful for us to learn from uh, you, Michael, and to become enlightened on who this individual is in our shared history. And uh, our prayers will just continue to uh, move us closer and closer together as we understand each other and appreciate uh, the orthodoxy in, uh, in both of us. Amen.